Yeah, I mean, we had a sale today that the young lady on my sales team, you know, when she explained the summit that I'm doing this weekend, the coaching summit, she explained it like this. And the person on the other end of the phone who was in Boston couldn't see enough value to spend that much money on the summit. It's $5,000 summit, right? Yeah. Well, when I got on the phone with him, I said, let me put this in a, a broader frame. Let me give you some more perspective on exactly what I'm going to be teaching. Let me show you how this is going to help you turn this into money quicker, right? Yes. Well, in one conversation with me, he was ready to buy. So what's the difference between me and her? My skill level is stronger than her skill level. Exactly. My experience is stronger than her. My confidence is higher than hers. Now... All right, everybody, this is Sam Taggart with Coach Burt, the author of 14 books. He is the yeah. ultimate coach on extracting the prey, like making making people have this ultimate prey instinct yes. come out of people and, and the coaching. And your motto mm -hmm. is everybody needs a coach in life, right? Yes. And you've gone and coached businesses and CEOs and salespeople and managers and mm -hmm. all these leaders. You've written all these books and been around the block, it looks like. We're here yeah. in Nashville or Nashville, outside of Nashville. I want to say Nashville. Right. What's the town called? Yeah, Murfreesboro, Murfreesboro. Tennessee. That's yeah. a tongue twister. Say yeah. that 10 times fast. <laughs> no. But we're here in his studio and, and we're going to be diving in on what makes a good coach yep. and why do people need a coach yep. and I really am excited about this concept and yeah. I think that I agree with you when you say everybody needs a coach mm -hmm. in life you know I was thinking about it with like movies or you think of like any any good movie you watch like the remember the titans and you watch any athletic film then you go watch any kind of film like even Aladdin had a coach right sure. I mean yeah. it's like like you, you think about it so I'm I'm really excited to dive in and obviously yeah. speaking at door to door con so sure. yeah are you excited for that I'm very excited about that thank you for having me yeah big and, stage and where where I'm just curious too where did you where did you find me where, how, did, how did you know? Did you see well, me somewhere? I was walking down 7th Street, and yeah. then <laughs> just kidding. this guy looks really cool. Yeah, yeah, hey, yeah. you, over on the side of the corner, you want to you yeah. speak? No. Uh, no, I looked, I mean, I saw you spoke at 10X Con, yeah. and I saw you speak at a couple other events, so I watched some of your YouTube videos, and I was like, yes. I, I resonate. Good. I like them Southern accents. Yes. I like that. I like yes. that little Bible Belt like That's right. slur. I like yes. the, you know, I, I really resonate with your message and, and how we craft the speakers with Ed Milet, mm -hmm. Tim Grover, you, uh, you know, we have Clint Pulver. Some of the, so, like we just said, what are all the principles that we want to hit on yes. from the main stage that all complement each other? Yes. I don't want a ton of like, Rah rah this and yes. rah rah this and rah rah this and it's like, dude, yeah. I'm almost hurt with the rah rahs. Yeah. I, I want like mentorship, this recruiting, this mm. sales, this rah rah this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And we kind of yep. really crafted the concepts of what we wanted is really what what really yeah. called us. And yeah. coaching is a big one. So we have you and Mark Eaton, mm -hmm. who's a former basketball player. Oh, you yeah. coach basketball. Yeah, yeah. He's the seven foot. Right. He's got a few. He's, yeah. he's a few feet taller than me. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. standing next to Mark's can be interesting. <laughs> but both of you two are really spoke speaking on team and coaching and kind of that that importance of kind of the mentor and coach. So sure. Great. Anyway. Yeah, so. no, I'm I'm very excited. I do believe, you know, I of course, I spoke with Ed Milet at 10X. Uh, uh, Tim Grover and I have become very good friends. We talk almost weekly. So it's just one of those things that I think it's a good lineup. I think what you put together is a quality lineup. And like you said, it's not just rah-rah. It's people who have real substance. They've built real businesses. They, 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 they've done something, right? Yes. They've, they've won something. They've achieved something. They've produced something. It's, not, it's, it's real people yeah. that are out there doing it, man. No, and that's that, and that's like one of the most important things is we don't want any fluff. We yes. want people that get it. Totally agree. Uh, so so let's dive into this. Like, what got you into coaching basketball? I mean, that's kind of what your yeah. initial. My initial when I was very young, uh, I was raised by a single mother who who worked two jobs, and she used to take me down to a local baseball field while she was working her second job, and I would stay down there for hours and hours and hours. And it was coaches that tended to me, that fed me, that that believed in me, that affirmed me. And one particular coach was a female coach named Mickey Vinson who was coaching Little League Baseball, which was kind of odd, right? Yeah. She was the one female coach. It was a male... It's like it was totally a, it was not a, normal. Yeah, it was a male-dominated yeah. deal. And but, but this woman really looked after me, cared for me, 
while my mother was working at this job. Yeah. And, and she used to say to me as early as six years old, son, one of these days, you're going to be a great coach. She recognized in th- she that in me. She said you were going to be the coach at a six-year-old. She, and, and Instead I, of like, you're going to be a great player. Yeah. Just, she used to say to me, son, one of these days, when you grow up, you're going to be a great coach. And I went back many years later and said, how did you know that? Yeah. She said, you're always so uh, curious. You were always directing and leading and guiding. and All your teammates are playing. You're sitting there playing the director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, like, like I was a great little player, but but I was... More so... But I co- really was concerned about the game and the potential of the other people as well. And so when I was in high school, my high school basketball coach called me professor. He said, the way you think, the way you analyze, you're always studying, thinking, and and, and maneuvering. So you know what, you I, know I knew what, from an early age. You know what my high school basketball coach called What's me? What's that? Coach Sam. Oh, yeah. Hey. I made a hat that said Coach Sam on it. Like, it, they made it for me. Yeah. And it wasn't because of what they said to you. It was because <laughs> I thought I knew more than oh, yeah, Coach. Yeah, that, that's fine. <laughs> so it wasn't a compliment. It was, yeah. Sam, shut up. Stop being yeah, yeah, trying yeah. to be Coach. So. I'll coach some players like that. Yes. So, uh, but, but that's kind of where it all started. Is so I hear, heard this my whole life. I started coaching junior pro basketball, which was just 9- to 12-year-old kids. I was 15. And then I became an elementary coach at 18. I was wow. recruited to the second largest high school in Tennessee, which happens to be in this city. Uh, when I was 19. So while I was going to college, I was already coaching. And that was very important. Now, that's that's also, there's an important part of the story there because I was introduced to Stephen Covey when I was 18. And I started reading The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I started studying the whole person theory. I started studying how to tap into the whole person, the body, the mind, the heart, and the spirit. And I began teaching my players those seven habits, which was unheard of. No other coaches were doing these things. Yeah, they're just saying run faster, yeah. shoot better. They didn't. The coaches didn't understand that there's more to a person than the body. The body is one component of a person's nature. This is very true in the sales world. You can have skill as a salesperson, but with no desire or prey drive, what I call prey drive, with the heart, what good is it to have knowledge with no desire? What good is it to have skill with no confidence? So when I learned this whole person theory, I began to go, okay, I can tap into all four parts of these players' nature. I can grow the body, that's skill, the mind, that's knowledge, the heart, that's passion, and the spirit, that's confidence. Mm. Okay? Now, if you look at salespeople out there in the world today, all over the world, if they are not producing, it is because they are deficient in one of those four components. I love that. Because we always talk about if they're not buying, they're not trusting the product, the company, the pro- you know, the, like whatever, right? The price. And it's like... What do we think of in the sales process to say, how do you diagnose? Exactly. Are you a 10 out of 10 on confidence? Okay, we're a seven. Exactly. Let's fix that. Yeah. Where are you at on your, I love that. Yeah. I mean, we had a sale today that the young lady on my sales team, you know, when she explained this summit that I'm doing this weekend, the coaching summit, she explained it like this. And the person on the other end of the phone who was in Boston couldn't see enough value to spend that much money on the summit. It's $5,000 summit, right? Yeah. Well, when I got on the phone with him, I said, let me put this in a, a broader frame. Let me give you some more perspective on exactly what I'm going to be teaching. Let me show you how this is going to help you turn this into money quicker, right? Yes. Well, in one conversation with me, he was ready to buy. So what's the difference between me and her? My skill level is stronger than her skill level. Exactly. My experience is stronger than her. My confidence is higher than hers. Now, it's not lack of effort on her part. She's got the desire, right? Yeah. She's got the prey drive. She's trying to make the sale. She just needs more coaching and skill and confidence. And that's why I'm her coach. So my goal with her is to get her to a million dollars of uh, commissionable income. So so I'm trying to get her, she's 25 years old, and I'm trying to get her to sell a million dollars of coaching a year, right, at 25. That's awesome. And so I I think I can get her right now to six or 700,000, but I'm coaching her every day. So I'm listening to her conversations. I'm giving her counsel. I'm going, you could do this. Let me explain what I said to him versus what you said to him. That see that when I learned the, the the theory from Covey, now any of your salespeople that are going to come to this conference, we could sit there and diagnose. Oh, this dude has got skill. He just don't have the effort. He don't make you know, right. Yeah. He don't knock oh, on enough doors. There's he don't. too many of those in our industry. Oh, like too many of those. Yeah. So 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 here's the deal. What would I say as a coach? I would say Sam, help now help me to understand how much money you'd like to earn this year, and you give me a number, and I'd say, yeah. well, well, help me to understand why you're you're putting this kind of effort into it. Are you mm. serious? On a scale of one to 10, Sam, how serious are you about making that much money? Well, I'm serious. Because it don't seem like you're that serious to me. Because you're telling me you're at a seven, I'm seeing a two or three effort. 
Your desire is not there, man. So, so what I try to do is take something real complicated and make it real simple. Yeah, and that's what a good coach really does. Yeah. So when I walk into a company or a sales team, I'm trying to take a complicated process and make it simple, man. Let's get better at these four things. Let's get better at this system. Then we can go sell more. I love that. Yeah. So let's let's break it down to the sales guy because a lot of sales guys listen to this and 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 maybe this we can then apply it to the manager and the owner you know because there's those people listening too so I'm I'm well no not the sales guy let's apply it to the sales manager yep. who's managing the sales guy yes. this is who I want to teach right here okay. yep. is I'm running a sales guy and I can't seem to get him to stop being complacent he's lazy yep. he's tired he's never working his efforts like yep. what are what are some key conversations I can have. Yep. To help pull this prey drive yes. out of him, because I feel like a good coach, there is a there's the They're true activators. ability yeah. to activate that. Yeah, and and there's a big difference. I I, I want to be no more as an activator versus a motivator. Yeah, because I can motivate all day, but yeah. at the, the end of the day, the, it goes away real quick. So I want you to think of prey drive as an instinctual it's uh, instinctual ability to see something and have the fortitude to go get it, like it's prevalent in dogs. A dog has a prey drive, right, mm. and And when that dog's prey drive is activated, I don't care how small that dog is or how innocent it seems, you would not want to be alone in the room with that dog. Yeah. Prey drive is the ability to 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 stalk, chase, kill prey, and bring it home. Okay. (laughs) So 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 a good salesperson has a prey drive. I believe humans have prey drive. Yes. Now, the job of the coach, the manager, is to activate that prey drive. So then you step back and you start asking. What would activate the prey drive in that salesperson that's complacent? Well, if you study motivational theories, uh, one motivational theory is satisfied needs never motivate a person, only unsatisfied needs. Mm. So if a person is likes the car they drive, the house they live in, where their kids go to school, they're making a decent income, what would activate their prey drive? All of their needs are met. Their prey drive has been suppressed because everything is good. Why would I need any more, right? Yeah. So to activate prey drive... You have to understand the activators of prey drive. Curiosity, uh, excuse me, competition is an activator of prey drive, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Inspired by other people is an activator of prey drive. Environments can be activators of prey drive. Compensation can be activator of prey drive. Fear of loss is a huge activator of prey drive. Mm. Meaning if I said, Sam, I'm looking at what you're doing, man, you're losing a quarter of a million dollars a year by not doing these three things. Yeah, by cutting out two hours of your day, that's right. add that up over a year, that's right. you just forfeited a month, that's right. and how much more money, you know, I mean, that's 100000 bucks to you. So the manager has got to understand these activators of prey drive because in each person it's different. Mm-hmm. For example, I was coaching a 61-year-old commercial real estate person in Boston yesterday, and she says to me, we do power hours. We do all of these things to incentivize who has the most phone calls. She's like, none of that activates my drive, coach. She said, I'm motivated to earn income so my son who's in college, I can give him some money and I can plan for my retirement. But these th- these games we're doing do nothing for me. Well, they don't understand that one size does not fit all when it comes to activating prey drive. Yeah. A good culture. Now, this is very important for all your for all your listeners and viewers. Like I'm coaching a culture in St. Louis, insurance culture, $25 million company. The owners are 33, 31, 28, 25 million bucks. They're doing 100,000 a day, okay? Uh-huh. They saw me teach this concept of prey drive. There are five activators of prey drive. They found a way to include all five into their culture. Hmm. They got competition, environment, fear of loss, compensation, right? Inspired by others. They, they've got all of these activators in their culture. So they've ingrained like a system that's, correct. that's associated that could to touch each all, one of the that five. Could, that could yeah. touch all five. And it might be a couple different systems. That's right. That, yeah, yeah. So the call the call deal that they're doing, it's not that it's bad, but that's only one, competition is only one activator. Like I'm a championship coach, but but I'm not truly motivated by competition. It's an odd thing. I like I don't wake up and say I got to be number one. Like, who's number one? Me, Grover, Milet, Cardone. Like, I don't, that's not what motivates me. What motivates me is you coming to me going, um, we're going to go out there and do something big. And I need, you, you, right? Like, I need your skill set to go do this. Like, I'm motivated by process. Yeah. I'm motivated by, let's, let's set a big target. Let's move toward that target. 
And the process of moving toward it is actually a big motivator for me. But I'm actually motivated by fear of loss, too. Yeah, it's like, what if I die and I didn't accomplish what I was supposed to? Or I built a good life and I don't want to lose it. Or I like the house I live in. Or I like the jet that I fly on. Or I like that. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, I'm motivated. Like, I've worked hard to build this. I don't want to lose it. So different people have different motivators of prey drive. Most managers, to your question, have never been trained even in how to activate prey drive. No, they did. It's like you go from sales guy to manager. That doesn't mean I know how to act. Like maybe internally I was a good sales guy. So that's why I'm a manager. But there's a difference between activating somebody else's prey yes. drive than it is yourself. Exactly. Like what does it for you may not do it for me. Exactly. So you, you telling me, you know, like I ask direct questions to people. And I say, Sam, help me to understand this. Or you said you wanted to do this, but your effort is saying this. Like, you're telling me this, but your body language is telling me this. Like, help me to understand, are you serious about making more money or not? Because if you're more serious, you'd be prospecting two hours a day. You'd be following up seven touches in the follow-up, right? You'd be trying to get six referrals out of every deal you're currently doing. Yeah. So it doesn't seem like to me you're that serious. It seems like to me you're serious about majoring in the minors. Like, I ask very hard questions to people as a coach where they go, you're right. I do need to buckle down. Like with my salespeople, I just ask them direct questions. Like you told me this, but you're doing this and I'm confused. Your and effort's confusing me. Being, and the, and the way that you're delivering that isn't coming off like no. rude. It's just saying, you're it's, saying this, but, and you're almost playing this whole kind of naiveness or not like yeah. it's intentional, but it's yeah. like, yeah. you're almost playing this, you're saying this, but dude, like your efforts showing you that like it, in the way that you're approaching it, yes. it's kind of like helping them come to their Here, here's own the deal. I want to build high degrees of personal responsibility in my people. Yeah. Meaning if Sam, you were on my team, when you're hitting your sales goals or trying to, you're not doing it for me. You're not doing it for my company. You're doing it for you and your family and your kids and your future. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like everything, like I don't believe in tricks. I don't believe in what I mean by that is I don't give away a lot of incentives or trips or a Starbucks gift card every day, or $100 if you do this. Here's yeah. the deal. I'm trying to build stone-cold killing machines, all right? I'm trying to build people who, Amen. who have... Who wants to build stone-cold yeah. killing yeah. machines? Man, that's, that's, what, like, that, yeah. that's what I'm trying to build. So yeah. I'm not interested in who, who's going to get a Starbucks gift card today. I'm interested in when you walk out of my office today, at the end of the day, Sam, the, the reward you get is your own personal satisfaction Yes, that you crushed it. You don't need Coach Bird to tell you. You don't need a gift card. I, I'm just a believer that I know when I've had a good day and when I've had a bad day. I don't need some trinket or gift or trip. Like, I want to earn enough income. that I don't get a reward trip. I can pay for my own trips. Yeah. I don't need you to give me a reward trip. I already I, have enough money yes. to buy wherever I want to go because yes. I'm a stone killer. Yeah. Like, I'm so a- so I'm, I don't need you to, like, incentivize me with a trip. I need you to keep coaching me so I can earn more income. Yes. I love that. That's what I'm interested in. So let's shift gears a little bit. Let's say I'm a sales rep Mm -hmm. and I don't have a great coach. Mm -hmm. I'm stuck in a situation where my manager maybe just never was trained. He was never really, you know, he's trying. I'm not saying he's a bad manager. I'm just Mm -hmm. simply saying he's not doing it for me. Like I can't really rely on him. Like what what advice would you give that sales guy? Well, I, I believe that. We are where we are today based on every choice we made up until today. Just because I have a lousy sales manager don't mean I can't hit my sales goals. There's plenty of sales collateral. There's plenty of things you can do. You can come to your conference. You can watch YouTube videos. You can get in online academies. You can get in a coaching program. Like, I don't believe that the individual salesperson should blame it on the manager because they're going to have more bad managers than good ones. Yeah. I think it's, look. It's pretty common. Yeah, it's pretty common. So, So here's the deal. It's your life. This ain't no practice life, man. You can blame whoever you want to, right? Yes. Now, that's scenario A. Scenario B is get in an environment where you can thrive in. Yeah. Go come work for a guy like me. Go work for a guy like Milet or or Grover or Cardone or Sam Taggart, whatever. Go work for somebody where where you can get apprenticed correctly. Because one mistake I see from the 20 to 30-year-old, now I'm 43 years old, right? I've been coaching for 27 years. One huge mistake I see the 20 to 30 year old make is they have not been properly groomed for success. And it's probably more common today's world than maybe 20 years ago. Absolutely. Because people want to fast track. They want the microwave mentality. Sure. You know what I mean? And it's, yeah. they think I better just do it on my own first. And yeah. that's what I've been trained and taught yeah. instead of, 
the apprenticeship stage, that whole yeah. four year, like you think of medical school, there's this apprenticeship. It's right. you're in your residency, you're going from doctor to doctor, you're, right. you know what I mean? And it's like in business, people aren't willing to do the apprenticeship yes. aspect. They like, need to go for the mentor over the money. And I, yeah. So anyway, you don't know my background a mm. lot, but I, I actually forfeited a way bigger opportunity in pay uh -huh. and a way higher pay, you know, opportunity to just stay with my manager one more year. I yeah. was like, can you, I just want to stay with you one more year. Yeah. And he's like, okay. I was yeah. like, dude, like, sure. I just am learning so much and yeah. I'm willing to pay in potential income for the education. Yes. And I looked at that as my college, like kind of there you go. degree. Yeah. But see, I, that's uncommon. It's so uncommon. That's, that's unheard like, no, of. Most people don't. Most know. people want to come and they may want to work or work with me for a short period of time. Then it's like you go at such a pace, I can't keep up. And I didn't know it was going to be this hard. Like we run through 20 to 30 year olds like crazy, which oh, is I'm why sure. which is why I like the 25 year old we have down there because she's tough. I couldn't run her off. Yeah. She kept showing up. Even when she didn't hit her sales number, she just kept showing up where another person would come in. And after a month, if, uh, a month, if they're not making high income, they want to quit. Yeah. They're like, this is hard. Like mm -hmm. I, I thought it was going to be motivational every day. Like I thought it was going to be run Coach Bird every day. Like I'm like we're running a business, man. Yeah, we got to sell something. Like like I am motivational. But but you mentioned something that triggered something in me. I'm intense, but I'm positive. I don't get negative when I get intense. Okay, a lot of people get negative. The more intense they get, the more negative they mm, become. They become more of like a like a tiger. Like it's like almost aggressive. Like through fear. Yeah, they motivate through fear. I try to do it in a way where you go. That dude's right, man. I do need to work harder. I can get better. I can reach my goals. He's fighting for me, right? Like if you study the NFL, 26% of the players in the NFL said they, they had any coach they could play for is Pete Carroll, Seattle Seahawks. Mm -hmm. And they ask, is he, because he's always clapping and upbeat and patting people on the back and he looks like he's having fun, right? And they ask his players, is he easy to play for? And every player's like, no. Like he has the most incredible expectations, you can imagine, but he's intense and he's positive, mm. which is why so many players want to play for him. He gets max. He's won a Super Bowl. He he gets maximum numbers out of his people, but he does it in a different way. That I got to stand over there <clears throat> and be miserable or yell or cuss at everybody. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. I'm kind of like a Pete Carroll. I like that. I'm upbeat. I'm positive. I'm friendly. But I'm not afraid to get intense. But 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 I will. But I will get but, in your grill. So here here's a here's a common thing in our industry. Managers are afraid to get intense and get true coaches in fear of running their sales guys off. And, com and, and, the, and, and it's so cutthroat, so competitive, mm -hmm. so, you know, well, I'll just go to this company. So threatening or, oh, if you don't pay me this or if I don't, you know, if you treat me like, like it's so finicky. And, and, and this is a problem in our industry where guys are afraid to truly get intense with their people and so they don't in fear of losing their sales guys. Like, they're good ones. Listen, I coached. I was a championship coach. I built a national championship culture. Here's what I would tell you, and here's what I tell those people. Anytime I play not to lose, it always guaranteed losing. Mm. When you play from a position of scarcity, holding on to everything, like I can't lose it. You understand what I'm saying? What you do is you start making very bad decisions. You need to play to win. Okay, so if I push the people down there and they leave, so what? There's 7 billion people. I'll get more. I, like, like, I'm only looking for people that are looking for me, man. I love that. I literally just did a speaking event here, mm -hmm. and I trained on recruiting, right? Mm -hmm. So recruiting is a big pillar in our business. Mm -hmm. And literally, there, everybody was like, well, I just don't want to recruit my competition. Or I, wanna, I don't want to train my competition. Yeah. So, and I'm like... Yeah, yeah. So you're not going to recruit because you don't want to train somebody that maybe will leave you one day. Right. You're like you're like three steps ahead of yourself, yeah. dude. It, <laughs> like, it's such a low level. Yeah, that, that's a low frequency thought. Oh, I was like, I literally when they said that to me, and it was like everybody was like, yeah, I'm like rallying around this yeah. guy, and I'm like, no wonder none of you have teams bigger than five. That it's such a scarcity mindset because it, I was scripted by Covey. You're either scripted in scarcity or abundance. Amen. Okay. Scarcity is, like I said, there's not enough. We're in competition with everybody. If you get a piece, it's taken away from my piece. The reality is there is no shortage of anything. Here's an example. It's like the ocean. Mm -hmm. You could get a teaspoon or a 20-gallon bucket, and the ocean don't care. It's infinite. It's Where does air stop out there and start in here? It's everywhere. 
So, right? So, so there's no shortage of money. There's no shortage of opportunity. There's no shortage of anything. There's a shortage of creativity. There's a shortage of courage. There's a shortage of confidence. Like those are low confidence, insecure people making those statements. I love like this. Like I got to hold on to everything. Uh, when, when I was coaching, you're taking me back to my old days here because when I was I co- love it. Let when it, I, when let I was a roll. basketball coach, after my first three or four years, I poured all this time and energy into these players and they opened up a new school because our city was growing. At one time, this city was the sixth fastest growing city in the United States. Okay, It's outside of Nashville. It's booming. And... So some of the players wanted to leave and go to the new school because uh, they could start. Maybe they're on the bench for me, and now they can go over here and start, right? Mm -hmm. And at first, I just freaked out because I was a young coach. I'm like, why would you leave? And oh, my gosh, here goes all my bench and scarcity. And then I made up my mind, no, 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 we have everything we need. To, to whip your butt, right? And and here's what I told him: you can go over there if you want to, but we're gonna we're gonna whip you. Yeah, like, you're we're gonna, gonna win. start as my bench, therefore you, I still win. That's right. <laughs> it's like, and then I made up my mind: we don't need we don't need you if you want to go over there, go over there. Well, it was such a it's such a defining moment for me because I figured out some of the people you think you need in your life you don't need. Okay, you, there's all the resources you need are in your network right now, right? You don't need. Like I like like I had dinner with Tim Story last night. He's one of my good friends. Is he here? Where were uh, you? He was in Nashville today speaking. What the heck? Tim Story. Yep. I so, literally listened to his and Ed My Let's yeah, podcast, there you go. and it yeah. like I almost cried. Like yeah. the guy seems freaking like. Oh, a he baller. is. He is. And so he was twenty twenty one. He he was in town. He'd be a great person for you. Yeah. He he was in town. He called me and said, "Let's have dinner," and uh, we had a great dinner last night. But but here's the deal. All, I, I just see all these connections that we have. And he was like, I was telling, Tim was telling my let the day before, he's like, man, you got to get to know Coach Burt better. Y'all are, you know what I'm saying? Like, story was with my let, and he was saying, man, I was telling my let, you two need to be together more. And it's just we're all one person away from a new season in life. Yeah. One connection. There's no shortage here is what I'm trying to tell you. Like, I was trying to get a number today for, uh, you know, different people, like Jordan Belfort. Today I was so trying to text you his number. Yeah, just text. I, I yeah, got you. Yeah, text me his number. See, <laughs> see there, there you go. go. That's what <laughs> I'm saying. I'm like, I'm like, I'll text you. That's what I'm saying. Okay, so, so my, my point is, because he spoke at your conference, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so my point is, you know, I want to have him on person of interest. He, I, I can be on his show, whatever. Um, but the concept is, it's out there. Yeah, it's available to us. Quit, quit playing scared. It's not, it. it's unattractive. I love it. It's unattractive. So we, we're short on time. So I want to, I want to ask. A couple last little quick questions, sure. just to kind of rapid fire. Mm-hmm. Uh, if you were to give, you know, the ten-year-old version of you, or maybe like the twenty-year-old yeah. version of you, let's yeah. go back to twenty-year-old. Oh, yeah. What would have you told him, knowing what you know now? You know, what like what would have there's you told? Two, there's two things. Those are easy for me. One is, I didn't have any bit real business coaching from twenty to thirty. I was a basketball coach. I didn't know the difference between an asset and a liability. Mm. I wish. I had had great business coaching because where I am today is good, but where I really could have been. Had you accelerated a little bit more the business side? In the business things. side, okay. Love the that. second thing is when I become a head coach early in my career, I I was very selfish. I was very focused on me, my program. I didn't care about the football team and this team. and So I really wasn't an ambassador for them. So instead of building advocates and allies and friends and people fighting for me, I really kind of kept to myself. I was, mm. I was, I was focused inward. And if I had to go back and tell the twenty-year-old coach, I'd say, "Man, support everybody. Love on the football team." Now, the same thing is true here. Like, like get out in the world and build advocates. Yeah, fight for people. L- l- support people. Don't be like, like don't be so self-centered and self-absorbed that it's all about you. Okay, just, Amen. just promote and believe and. And people ask me all the time, well, what did you think about these two dudes getting in an argument with each other? I'm like, man, I like both of those dudes. Yeah, both of them the- bring something to the equation. I have uh, mad respect for them because I don't want to get caught up in feelings and dramas. and it, it's, it's, it's small time to me. We're majoring in the minors. This dude's that. a world class dude. In the yeah. Minors. This dude's a world class dude, and this dude's a world class dude. And they may not like each other for whatever reason, but it's Who okay. Cares? It's okay, man. Le- I- learn something from both of them. 
And, 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 and you said something else, like be, you get involved in the football, even though you're the basketball program, say, how do I have my hand in a few things yes. and be out there? Like, it's so funny. I, I was reading some of your book uh-huh. titles, uh-huh. even it's swing with a monster. Yeah. Accountable church, which yep. is for church people. I'm yeah. assuming uh-huh. swag, yep. which is confidence, confidence. Yep. You got the anatomy of winning, yep. which is more, I'm assuming sports related, sports related. how to build cultures. Yep. You have inside the monster's mind, yep. which, you know what I mean? There's so different niches. Yeah. You have three different podcasts to yeah. be kind of, Hey, like yeah. I'm touching on religious to this, right. to that. And, and, and I think that's, I think there's something we said where so many people are like, just be in your own little like corner. Yeah. And I'm kind of like, well, how do you impact the most amount of people if your corner's really small? Yeah. <laughs> like, and, and, and the reality is I believe in intentional congruence and intentional congruence is where everything feeds everything. Yes. I do not separate out my faith and my and my personal life and my work life. It's all one life. It's one integrated life, okay? So I may be in Boston one day talking to Christian leaders on my book, The Accountable Church, and the very next day speaking to a multi-level marketing company and the very next day speaking to uh, a, a hedge fund managers. And the, you understand what I'm saying? Yep. Like to me, it's all one deal, man. It's just one deal. I don't separate this out. It all goes back to coaching. At the end of the day, the intentional congruence is it all goes back to my belief that everybody needs a coach in life. I love it. I wrote the book for churches because my pastor asked me to coach him one summer. And he said, man, I was giving him all these strategies we use over in the coaching world. And he's like, well, our church is not doing any of these things. Yeah. And I'm like, well, well your tr- church is just a structure. You're trying to build something dynamic where people come back over and over and over and over, right? Yes. Well, that's what we're trying to do. So if there's tactics we're using that you're not using, would you be open to use them? He's like, you got to write a book on this. And I resisted. I'm like, man, I, I, I'm, I'm not I'm a pastor. A business, yeah. I'm not a pastor. I'm not qualified to write a book for churches. And it's interesting that this book is that there's a hungry group of pastors out there who are going, this is what we need to be reading. This is what we need to hear. Yeah. This is what we need That's to be thinking. That's not being taught, yeah. That's right. It's just a, it's a I call it vuja day. And, uh, vuja day. Yeah, it's not deja vu. Love that. Deja vu is where you've heard something before. It seems comfortable. Vuja day is where you bring a new way of thinking to an old perspective. Mm. It's like I'm bringing a twist. Like as, I'm, I'm, like as a church goer my whole life, me and Tim's story had a fascinating conversation about this because he started Congregation Church, you know. And so he said, I got to help you get this book into Christian leaders' hands around the country. That's the co- correlation that my lead and I have together. I you love know, that. that's that's kind of the common bond between those three speakers at 10x between me and my lead. And uh, yeah, and me Tim and my let's podcast. It was very we, at the end. We started jamming religion for a while. Yeah, so yeah, I'm like, I don't care. Yeah, yeah. Well, I I appreciate you being on the show, and I'm excited Absolutely. for you to come out in January. And man, I, I'm, I'm so Salt Lake honored. City, DVD, I'm excited. I, I appreciate you. I knew. The first time you and I talked that you were a genuine dude and and I looked at some of your past conferences and I, I just, I think this is going to be a great conference. If you're out there and you're thinking about coming to this conference, I'm telling you, you will get your money's worth. I've looked at the speakers. I've looked at the lineup. I've looked at, I just think, man, come out and enjoy Salt Lake, right? Yeah. Come out and enjoy it. Yeah. It's a enjoy. beautiful place. Yeah. So, so go with us. I'm going to be there. Some of my team members are going to be there. My wife's looking to go in there with me. You know, so it's all a good thing. We're excited. Love it. Well, thanks yeah. so much for being on the show, Thank man. Thank you, man. Thank you. Thank you. Much love, guys. We'll see you.